Hello, everybody. I'm so very thrilled to be welcoming this incredible community together. We have folks coming from near and far, from the suburbs, from Southern Illinois, from uh, the South Side, and, and well beyond, because tonight's conversation is going to be amazing. Um, I'm Gabrielle Lyon. I'm the Executive Director of Illinois Humanities, and I want to welcome every one of you here tonight and to thank you for being in community with us. These are special times and these gatherings really are important. Um, while we get started, I see people are saying hello. If you haven't already introduced yourself in the chat, please introduce yourself and let us know where you're uh, joining us from. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone to Illinois Humanities in case you're not already familiar with us. Illinois Humanities is a nonprofit organization. We are the state affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. But the most important thing I want everyone to know is that we are totally committed to activating the humanities through free public programs, through grants and educational opportunities like the one we're part of tonight that foster reflection, spark conversation, build community, and most of all, strengthen our civic engagement, especially with one another. This year, something very special happened. Illinois Humanities was awarded a Big Read grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and Arts Midwest, and that helped us amplify the outstanding work of one of our great programs called the Long Overdue Book Group. And these facilitators are all graduates of another one of our programs called the Odyssey Project. And I have a feeling we'll learn a little bit about the Odyssey Project in the chat. Um, so tonight is something special because it's facilitators from our Long Overdue Book Group who are graduates of our Odyssey Project. And all of them are bringing us together for tonight's program, Afrofuturism. Before I turn um, the proverbial mic over to my fabulous colleague, Becky Amato, um, I'd really like to take a second to respectfully acknowledge that the land from which I'm presenting here in Chicago is made up of the territories and lands of the people of the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Odawa nations, as well as many other tribes who have called this place home, including the Miami, the Ho-Chunk, Sacs, and Fox nations. These nations were forcefully removed from their traditional territories, but these lands continue to carry the stories, the resilience, the tenacity of the peoples of these nations. For example, despite the federal and local government enforced policies of genocide of American Indians, Chicago remains home to the third largest urban American Indian population, representing more than a hundred different tribal nations. Also, I want to acknowledge that land acknowledgement statements are most meaningful when they're actually coupled with a commitment to programs and actions that support indigenous rights and cultural equity. And I want to acknowledge that Illinois Humanities is just starting our journey. We have a lot more work to do, but we are committed to supporting and building sustained relationships with indigenous organizations of which there are many throughout Illinois. And we hope that you'll support and participate and partner with these organizations and efforts as well. On that note, I can't think of a better partner to be part of tonight's program than our very own Becky Amato, our Director of Teaching and Learning and the project lead for the Big Read this year. Becky, it's you. Sorry, that took a second. Uh, technology is complicated. Um, I think that Gabe and I might have dressed so that we would match the beautiful image on the cover of our poster, um, which comes from one of the books from one of our wonderful guests this evening. Um, I, before we start uh, and I get to introduce our great guests, I wanted to acknowledge the people who have made the Big Read possible and provide some of the light guidance on, that you might need to see how this program will unfold. Before I do that, I also wanted to mention that thanks to our speakers, I learned that today is the 154th birthday of W.E.B. Du Bois. And one might say that he wrote the first Afrofuturist text, which was called The Comet. It's a short story and it's available um, on Project Gutenberg and it was written in 1920. So I hope that you will 
go ahead and uh, discover it if you've not discovered it already. So enormous gratitude goes for a big read dream team, which is a lot of people to name. That includes Nicole Bond, Mateo Gonzalez, Joe McEntee, Itzel Munoz, <clears throat> Wanda Obazi, Ruben Quesada, Toy Robinson, Sylvia Taylor, Jen Yu, Alyssa Bierce, Michael Foley, Tia Williams, and Chris Kazaitis. And of course, thanks always to our executive director, Gabe Lyon, and the many members of the Illinois Humanities staff who supported work on this project over the past several months. It's really been an adventure. I'd also like to thank our Big Read partners and funders, the Brighton Park Public Library, the Blue Island Public Library, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, and especially our generous funders, the National Endowment for the Arts and Arts Midwest, without whom this evening would not be possible. So some housekeeping. Uh, you'll be muted during the event, but we encourage you to ask questions of the panelists using the Q&A function, which you will see down at the bottom of the screen. I'm co-moderating the chat this evening along with my colleague, Jennifer Yu, and we will be gathering any questions that come in in the chat there as well. We'll also be providing, and you may have noticed this already, uh, live captioning during the event for those who need it. So be sure to select live captioning um, as an option at the bottom of the screen if you need that kind of support um, or if you just like it. The theme of our big read this year has been Rememory, Haunting Trauma and Historical Memory, Historical Fiction, which has allowed us to explore generational trauma, the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, and the supernatural through powerful books like Toni Morrison's Beloved, Octavia Butler's Kindred, and Alejo Carpentier's The Kingdom of This World. We found through our readings that a critical part of reclaiming and healing from the past is to see it as part of a forward movement toward different creative and hopefully more just futures. One of the reasons we've been so thrilled to bring our speakers, Natasha and John, into our space this evening is not only because they conceptualize Afrofuturism in ways that bring together all of the arts and humanities and imagining and materializing new black futures, but because they trace much of this thinking to our beloved Chicago and maybe even throughout Illinois, but we'll find out soon. Um, now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Yatasha Womack and John Jennings. I'm gonna read uh, some short bios and we'll turn over the conversation. Yatasha L. Womack is an award-winning author, director, and dancer. Her books include Afrofuturism, The World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture, the sci-fi novel Rayla 2212, Post Black, and Beats, Rhymes, and Life, What We Love and Hate About Hip Hop. Afrofuturism is a 2014 Locus Awards nonfiction finalist. She's a frequent lecturer on Afrofuturism and showcases at comic cons and science fiction conferences around the world. And she currently co-helms Afrofuturism 849, a Chicago-based group that provides workshops and events for the Afrofuturist community. Yutasha is a Chicago native. She has a BA in Mass Media Arts from Clark Atlanta University, studied arts, entertainment, and media management at Columbia College, and has a master's certificate in better living, a study in metaphysics, and new thought philosophy from the Johnny Coleman Institute. Welcome, Natasha. John Jennings is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside. Jennings is co-editor of the Eisner Award-winning collection, The Blacker Wealth, well, oh, something happened with my strange email. Please tell us what the name of the book is later, uh, but it's Constructions of the Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art. Jennings is also a 2016 Nasser Jones Hip Hop Studies Fellow with the Hutchins Center at Harvard University, thank you, John, at Harvard University. Jennings' current projects include the horror anthology Box of Bones, the coffee table book Black Comics Returns with Damian Duffy, and again, the Eisner winning, Bram Stoker award winning, New York Times bestselling graphic novel adaptation of the wonderful Octavia Butler's Kindred. Jennings is also founder and curator of the Abrams Megascope line of graphic novels and a 2021 Hugo Award winner for the illustrations on Abrams comic arts graphic novelization of Parable of the Sower. This is so exciting. Um, I'm really happy that you're both here and I'm uh, maybe gushing a little bit. So I'm just gonna send it over to you, Natasha and John. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, wow. <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, Natasha and I talk often about 
all of these things. And so, you know, it's kind of wonderful to actually uh, be in, 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 in conversation with the, uh, the wonderful people of Illinois. You know, I have a, obviously, Yatasha is a, a native, but I'm, I'm also, uh, I look at Chicago as like my second home, spent a lot of time, time there, so we can get into that too. But um, yeah, uh, hey, Yatasha, how you doing? <laughs> hey there, how's it going? I have my tea, I am ready. Um, can I note that we both have similar images behind us? Oh, that's right. uh, symbols of the masculine and feminine in the African diaspora um, as a, a way of speaking to, um, I guess, the, the relationship between uh, the conscious and the unconscious minds um, or your thinking and feeling natures and I just think that's kind of special. I just noticed it. I was like, oh, well, we're twins. Well, I mean, I, I think definitely it's a part of uh, some of the things we've been talking about over the last decade or so around Afrofuturism and, um, and other aspects uh, of Black speculative culture. You know, um, I definitely think that, and I just mentioned this in my class, actually, that to me, it seems like a lot of the conversations around Black speculation have been led by Black women as far as like from the creative side, uh, big shout outs to people like Nalo Hopkinson, N.K. Jemison, Tanana Reeve Du, yourself, Yatasha, uh, Octavia Butler, of course, um, but also like scholars and, and people and content creators who've been talking about this work uh, a lot. Seems like uh, Yatasha has been suspended in animation a little bit. So <laughs> um, I'm gonna, uh, let's see here, if she comes back on. I'm going to just soldier for it and, uh, we can start off with a couple, you know, with some questions about um, about Afrofuturism and about other aspects of Black state of culture. So I guess the first thing that we can talk about uh, is what is Afrofuturism? It's the first thing that people ask about because it's a it's a it's a really uh, um, you know it's a really like I guess a, a very attractive term to a certain degree uh, for for things we've been doing for a long time. Uh, Yatasha literally wrote the book on Afro. Futurism. So, you know, I think that it would be fair to uh, to feel that question to you, Yatasha. So how do you define Afrofuturism? Uh, I'm glad you're back, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I always say that Afrofuturism is a way of looking at the future or alternate realities, but through a, a Black cultural lens. And when I say the word Black, I'm, I'm talking about Black people around the world, whether you're in, you know, America, the UK, Brazil, Ghana, South Africa, Australia, et cetera, wherever you may be. And I say that it's an artistic aesthetic, uh, but it's a, also a, a method and a practice. It can be a mode for healing, particularly around the imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think of it as a, a wheel. And if the center of that wheel was Black culture, then the spokes in that wheel, the intersecting lines would be imagination, liberation, technology, mysticism. And I think if you look at most works that we call Afrofuturist, you'll find that there's an interweaving of these ideas. No, I, I have to agree. I mean, I was, um, you know, also too, I was, I was just talking about the, the privileging of like, you know, this kind of like black woman, womanist ideologies as far as like, you know, uh, looking at, you know, looking at black women as uh, protagonists and as, as central figures and, and talking about this work. You know, if you look at like some of the seminal work from like Octavia Butler and, and, and everyone that she's inspired, um, the other thing too is like, you know, I definitely think that the idea of spirituality is something that's very present as, as you said, in a lot of the Afrofuturist work. Um, the other thing is like intersecting with different types of technology, right? Um, so, you know, in Derry's original uh, coinage of the term in what, 1993 or so, right? In his, in his essay uh, mm -hmm. and a series of uh, interviews, um, technology is a huge part of it. And I think, you know, some of the things that I, that I think about with the original definition is like, well, what types of technologies, you know, and something that Yatasha and I talk about a lot of is like, well, you know, this idea of ancient technologies, yeah, some say 1994, that's right. It depends, you know, cause it was, I think it was, it was published first in a magazine, but yeah, it's in the early nineties, right? Um, basically talking about like, you know, black uh, cultural production in, um, 
you know, actually African, and actually says African American cultural production. That's, that's one of the things too. It's not necessarily at first talking about the diaspora. We're talking more so about, you know, black folk and techno culture in America to a certain degree. And yeah, and I think it's. Yeah. Uh, let me just note. I think it's important to say that you know Mark Derry's essay was exploratory. That's right. Um, he wasn't thinking of it as a definitive. I'm sure to some extent he's as surprised we're using the term as Afrofuturism. Um, as, as anyone else might be, but he was looking to explore these ideas uh, and he grounded it, as you mentioned, thinking of it as an African-American idea, but since then it's, we've engaged uh, the perspectives, uh, this idea of space and place around the world. That's correct, that's correct. Yeah, and you're right, it's, it was very much exploratory. I mean, he had these, uh, he, even, in the, even in the definition itself, he uses the, ter the, the terminology for want of a better term is actually built into the definition. So that's wiggle room, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, well, you know, for right now, you know, I'm thinking about these ideas, I'm looking at these cultural production spaces. So for one of a better term, we shall use the term Afrofuturism, right? And I think that's very interesting because, you know, as, Af as, as you talked about stating, like there's been uh, various modes of expression that have kind of, kind of grown out of that. But then of course, you know, um, right after that, a little bit after that, you have, the, uh, the classic journal uh, that um, Alondra Nelson uh, uh, edits, right? Social text, which starts to push the boundaries even further as far as like just challenging, you know, should this particular term be mutable or should it be, you know, a lot more concrete, you know? And, and I think, uh, you know, we make, just make sure to, that, that Alondra Nelson is in this conversation as much as possible because, you know, that particular book is a groundbreaking, a groundbreaking book as well. Along and she popularized the term too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So like, I, you read my I, mind. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> John and I talk frequently, so we might just start overlapping at some point. But yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, though. Especially with the listserv, correct? I mean, it's right with the listserv. I mean, I I think the reason we use the term today is in part because she created a listserv and had so many artists and thinkers creatives, many of whom were college students, you know, working with these ideas of Afrofuturism, and they're looking to, they're just trying to ground the ideas that they were were speaking to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a story I tell sometimes about, you know, having a, a conversation on my college campus with a student, uh, a fellow student, and him talking about these ideas of quantum physics and hip-hop and futures and technologies and and me really asking, well, what is this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of dialogue was not an isolated one. Many people were trying to ground those ideas and Alondra Nelson created, well, used the early technology for people of different walks of life to be able to do so. No, that's, and, 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 yeah, and that's, and I love the fact that now she's, uh, moved on into these different spaces doing uh, work with, you know, genetics and um, various aspects of the physical sciences, biological sciences, and is in the cabinet, right, as of, uh, of the Biden administration currently, right? So I think that's, to have like a, a legendary Afrofuturist in that space, I think is pretty awesome. Um, so I, I wanna, uh, and we'll probably play around with this a little bit more too, as far as like the definitions, but um, and this is a really cool question. Uh, so once a cultural movement has been defined, we often find there are a lot of antecedents, right? So no, no movement or revolution emerges from a vacuum. Uh, what are some of the antecedents to what we now call Afrofuturism? You know, so basically like, you know, what it was come before, right? So that's a great question. Uh, did you want to start out with that, Yatasha, or you want to? Well, I guess my, my first thought with that is to say that everyone has a relationship to their own future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, regardless of where you are in the world, what culture you're part of, how you identify. And so... Uh, because of that, there's always these works that are symbolic of a person looking to see where they are in time and space. Who am I in the universe? Who am I on this planet? Um, what entities am I engaging with? What helps me to navigate my life? And some of those ideas become philosophies. And those philosophies are evident in our art, in our architecture, in um, how people socialize, they're very much ingrained in the culture. You know, oftentimes when people uh, you know, talk about the diaspora um, and people who've 
came to the Americas, you know, enslaved, you know, there's a conversation about recovery mm -hmm. uh, and what was lost, which I think is a valuable conversation. But a, a friend of mine, Sean Wallace, who's a musician, he always says that it's also about what remained. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes things are hidden in plain sight. Uh, and I think of Afrofuturism in that way, mm -hmm. you know, as something that maybe you didn't, you know, see it in in mainstream films, uh, you know, the, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, et cetera. Uh, maybe someone wasn't specifically talking about a spaceship, uh, but they're still working with these ideas of time and space. Um, so... I, I just like to add that framing um, to it. I think a lot of our musical traditions are philosophies around time and space. Mm -hmm. You think about the the polyrhythms, you know, out of a lot of the music in the African continent. You think about the uh, rhythms that come out of rumba, freestyle traditions out of the uh, Americas. You know, the patterns. Uh, that are established in in those rhythms, I, I think are they also are technologies themselves. And, and you talk frequently about drumming being a technology, That's right. uh, a way of communicating. And when you think of it in that way, it transforms this idea of well, what are we talking about when we say Afrofuturism? No, that's uh, I think that's totally true. Um, you know, it's funny like that, that question starts to open up a, a kind of a Pandora's box of you know, what, what do we call a thing, right? Um, and this is something I was talking to our friend Julian Shambliss about quite recently, like, well, if if something's defined, you know, presently, and then we find something that actually fits that particular, you know, uh, definition, is that thing, you know, Afrofuturist, you know, that kind of, or is it whatever that, that term is we're dealing with? I just posted in the chat um, a story about one of my favorite things, which is uh, The Princess Steel by W.B. Du Bois which is a science fiction story that was written uh, in 1905 or 1909, you know, it depends, but it was while he was still in, you know, uh, in Atlanta. Um, and it's about a device called the Megascope, which is where I get the name of my imprint from, that is used as a framing mechanism. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the device is a, is a, is a, is a, it's a prototype of a, of, a, of, a, of a machine that can actually see through time and space and other dimensions, right? Um, and this is written, uh, in 1909 or so, right? This is before the comet, right? And, um, you know, the other thing is, is interesting to, to note is that this particular framing mechanism, it actually, like, it, it's, an, it, it's opened up to a tale as an allegory, almost like a Tolkien-esque, like, you know, Ar Ar Arthurian legend about this, uh, about this, this, uh, this entity, this princess who represents, like, the steel industry. So the whole thing is an allegory about his critique of the steel industry. The really interesting thing about it is that, you know, yes, it's a science fiction fantasy story, but it also predates the naming. And a lot of these, these er earlier works predates the term science fiction, which I think is really interesting. The, the, the term uh, science fiction is coined by, um, was it Hugo Gernsback, I believe, in, in the 1920s. So stuff like The Princess Steel, Of One Blood by, uh, was it Pauline Hopkins, I, think, I believe, it's 1902, you know? Right. Uh, Sudden Griggs's work, Imperium Imperio. Uh, there's a lot of like black speculative work that comes out before we even call science fiction science fiction, which I think is really an interesting idea. And um, one of the things I toil around a lot with in my class, Polly Hopkins, thank you, um, is racist science fiction. This idea of the term race, you know, because we were talking about like, you know, different types of technologies. I picked that up from uh, John Acampra's film, uh, The Last Angel of History, which is a a film, an experimental film that was made, I think it was 1997, uh, a little bit after the coinage of the term Afrofuturism, where John Confer, who himself is, you know, of the diaspora, I forgot which country in Africa he's from, sorry about that, but he was raised in England, you know, and he's doing a uh, a, a deep dive looking at, you know, music, uh, as Yutash was re referencing, and other types of, like, narrative forms and black speculation. And at the beginning of it, he has this, um, this entity, let me see, can I share a screen right quick? Uh, I might have a, a picture of them. You know, this is some of my artwork that actually led me to think about um, Afrofuturism, but I'm trying to find the, oh, there he is, the data thief, right? The data thief is this construct in the film where he's a time traveling archeologist who is trying to put together different aspects of um, 
you know, popular culture, uh, black popular culture, and he's at this crossroads. And he probably noticed the, the story of, of Robert Johnson, where he supposedly sells his soul to the devil. And in the in the in the uh, the film, he says uh, that Robert Johnson receives from this entity at the crossroads a black secret technology, and that technology is called the blues. And I was like, wow, you know, being from Mississippi, you know, and I grew up with this story. I grew up with the blues, and of course, Chicago is uh, another you know, touchstone for the, for the blues, right? Because of the great migration and other factors. So I just, I just really didn't, this inspired me to make a bunch of artwork around, you know, blues as a technology. But, um, you know, to kind of like go back to this question, it's like, I think that we've always been speculating, you know, uh, better futures, uh, better spaces. I often state like the first like real Afrofuturist in this country is the first slave of slaves that said, you know what, I don't, I don't think slavery is working for me. <laughs> I'm gonna, we're gonna follow this car. <laughs> gonna follow this that was a, that <laughs> was a, a, a decision made early on. Right. Very early. Yeah, yeah. In the, this the is not good for us. <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, we're getting up out of here, you know. And so that is a speculative notion, right? A better space. So I think um, way before the, the coinage of the term, and, and and of course another, uh, um, another another uh, aspect is. Um, uh, Sherry Renee, Renee Thomas's book, right, uh, um, Dark Matter, which really, really thinks a lot about like black speculative work from a, a very different uh, standpoint. With a lot of black literature, you know, like Du Bois's work, like um, you know Toni Morrison's work, could be considered speculative. And so it, it expands past like Afrofuturism to thinking about black speculative arts or black speculative culture, right? And I I'd like to think that that's one of the first anthologies with so many Black speculative stories right. um, in one space. I remember that being a big topic of conversation uh, yeah. when the book came out before I was thought I was thinking about Afrofuturism, right? And people just saying how it's like, oh, wow, there's all these Black science fiction stories. And they're just being a surprise at how old some of these stories were. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, stuff like, you know, um, The Conjure Woman, right, by Charles Chestnut is in there, things like that. Or, you know, works by Octavia Butler, Sam Delaney. You know, it, it, it really just, I think it was a brilliant collection. And actually, it really inspired a lot of stuff that I think about. I think it was a similar work. Um, let's see. So I another question that, that, that comes to mind is, like, can you talk a bit about uh, how Afrofuturism appears in different cultural forms, like fashion, film, music, uh, visual arts, everything. We kind of touched on literature a little bit. Uh, did you want to talk mm -hmm. about performance art and uh, dance and, and those uh, music? Well, sure. I mean, I always think of, of dance as this articulation of space and time. And when I did the film, A Love Letter to the Ancestors from Chicago, it was my statement about dance being Afrofuturist. Mm -hmm. um, some of my earliest relationships to how I thought about Afrofuturism came out of dance. And I, I had a real desire to continue to articulate that. Um, because often, sometimes you would be in, I would be in these situations where people would think about Afrofuturism, you know, they immediately think about the literature. Of course, they're going to think about the music, Parliament Funkadelic and Sun Ra, et cetera. Um, and there seemed to be this idea that Afrofuturism was very much in the head. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, a, a space of, of contemplation. Uh, wasn't necessarily something embodied. And that is the exact opposite of how I came to understand Afrofuturism in part. You know, I grew up in a metaphysical school of thinking, and I grew up as a, a child who was very much a dancer and get engaging with, you know, a lot of my foundation was tap dance. So, you know, and sometimes we would be tap dancing to Afro-Latin jazz. <laughs> so you have these complex rhythms, and in the space of those rhythms, epiphanies would happen. Um, the same thing would happen when I was doing house music dancing, you know, really getting into freestyle. And when I went to Clark Atlanta, um, you know, for college, there was just a, a, a broader space for uh, this freestyle movement and where you can merge African dance and modern and uh, flamenco, even if you wanted to. And in that, there just seemed to be this, uh, this larger relationship and sense of self around space and place. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I, I kept thinking, how do I articulate that? And, and it wasn't until I actually went to Cuba and learned rumba dancing um, that I understood how embodied dance was and how it really grounded people. And it was not just about this physicality. Um, it was also about electrifying chakra systems. And, you know, that being a higher art form, uh, an intelligence that's coming out of the body uh, that can be revelatory. Um, in the same way that reading great literature can be or um, studying an awesome nonfiction book. Uh, but the thing to me about dance was that it claims features and past. Uh, when we talk about this idea of Sankofa, which has become seminal in not just Pan-Africanism, but I think also Afrofuturism, there's this, op this, this dynamic of reaching, you know, looking at the best of the past and moving it forward. And thinking about a past and thinking about a future changes your present. Uh, right. To me, dance was an activation of that. And because we're doing moves that are ancient in nature sometimes, whether we're cognizant of it or not, uh, and in doing so, you're connected to those people who did it in the past, but it can also be an homage to not just ancestors, but an homage to people who would do those kinds of movements in the future. Uh, and it was, I was able to articulate that, but I, I really have to give a lot of credence to the, the schools of dance I came through here in Chicago, mm -hmm. you know, Whitney Young High School, Mayfair Dance Academy, the house music scene. Um, all of them, without giving a language to it specifically, very much were spaces where I could see an interdimensionality of self through movement. Uh, and I, I think of that as very Afrofuturist. Um, when I had a chance to go to Senegal and I went to the School of the Sands, of the, they have a sp specific technique, like an African contemporary technique. And it verified everything I had ever thought about what foundational African, African diasporic movements were mm -hmm. and where they were coming from and what their purpose is. So, you know, when I, I talk about Afrofuturism and I mention that, you know, I, I say it's, sep it's different from other takes on futurism because it, it claims this divine feminine, mm -hmm. you know, it values the intuition um, it, it values nature, it values the body, but it also sees this relationship between mysticism and technology. Yes, yes. No, I totally agree with that. I was, there's so many things in my head. <laughs> so yes, um, I think, um, I want to say it was Eric Davis that came up with this book in the 90s called Technosis, right? Which was looking at like spirituality as a type of technology. And so I definitely think that there's a connection between like thinking about various types of ancestral technologies uh, that I think kind of upends westernized notions of what we think technology is and how it functions. Because really it's like an extension of prosthetic by which we understand the world, you know, so stories of technologies, that types of thing. Uh, the other thing I want to pick up on too before we move on a little bit is, um, you know, I'm a huge comics fan and I'm, I'm a comic scholar. So if you look at like the original um, text by Derry, you know, Black to the Future, the, uh, the, 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 the exploratory uh, essay uh, is illustrated by five images, right? One of which is an image uh, by Rem LZ, you know, the great like hip hop uh, performer and graffiti artist and, and performance artist. And the other four are comic book images. Two are from uh, Why, I Hate Sat uh, Why I Hate Saturn by Kyle Baker and the other two are from Milestone Media. Because in the text, uh, Derry often, he basically po points out that the, the current like comics uh, pr production of the time was related to an Afrofuturist aesthetic. And for some reason that gets like kind of forgotten or it's been erased or I've been like working a lot to kind of reconnect those things as far as like a literary form, which is why I'm so interested in comics because there's an in inherently surreal nature to the comics medium, I feel, that resonates really well with, you know, um, with Afrofuturism. Um, I was going to say too, as we were talking, oh yeah, I know the other thing, dance, right? One of the things that fascinates me about dance as a graphic designer and a, and a visual communicator is the fact that the word choreography literally means dance writing. Right, mm -hmm. uh, dance writing, and so I, so I thought about the idea that dancers don't have dance classes; they have composition classes, right? Um, and that when a, a dancer is thinking about movement, 
they are trying to create a movement vocabulary, right? So, so I like this idea of communication and I think it definitely really becomes more of a liberation technology as me and Clint Fluker like to call it. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I'm gonna say something else because we're, we're moving into this idea of place because you mentioned the notion of like this kind of uh, the diasporic relationships because I think that's a more expansive notion that's kind of come into, into vogue over the last say eight years or so related to Afrofuturism. Um, there's an article, uh, Afrofuturism, African Futurism and Writing Black Futures in the Portalist. Um, and, and the author points out that there's some scholars who make the distinction, distinction between Afrofuturism and African Futurism. Is this an important distinction? Uh, why or why not? You know, that's, that's something that actually Peter asked a while ago too in the chat. Uh, the differences between uh, these constructions between Afrofuturism and African Futurism. What do you what do you think of that? Well, I think that anywhere you are, you know, regardless of where you are in the world, is going to inform how you think about these ideas. Right. Um, your relationship to space and place is in part based on where you are. Uh, I, I think that, and it's so we are going to be informed how you shape your idea about futures um, is clearly it's going to be shaped by, by culture and where you're based. Mm -hmm. I like the term Afrofuturism because I like thinking of our different locales and our different cultures as complements. Uh, and to the extent that there's differences, um, I see those differences as, uh, as complements and, and spaces to explore. Mm -hmm. To me, they are, you're looking at threads that intersect and are moving in the same direction, um, but it's a symbiotic relationship. So I, it's hard for me not to look at it as a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I, I, I'm very much, very big on people acknowledging uh, what is informing them. You know, as an artist, as a creative, what informs you? Um, if you're based in America, that's going to shape how you may see things. You know, us. I mean, you grew up in Mississippi. I grew up in Chicago. There are many. You know, my grandparents were from Mississippi. That's going to shape how we see things. Me being a descendant of the Great Migration shapes how I see things, right? Um, and recognizing that I think is very important. Uh, so it, it's more, it's not so much about, I think the, the joy of calling it the works Afrofuturism is that it's a, a term that creates a lot of synergy for many people. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, if there's another term that works for people that better speaks to who they are and how they see themselves, all of that is, is valuable as well. To me, what's most important is that people of African descent, people in the African continent are able to tell stories of a speculative nature and our people who want to find those stories can find them. Right. <laughs> I don't, that's, that's, a, that's a really great point. I, um, it's funny because there's, you know, a lot of people took a lot of umbrage with the fact that Mark Derry is a white scholar and he was, you know, in this space naming this particular type of cultural production. Um, you know, at first, I think I was probably one of those people, you know, at first, you know, and I, I was thinking, um, that's why I think, you know, me and my friend, uh, Adelifu Nama, you know, created this uh, kind of like Afrofuturist think tank or Black speculative think tank called um, Astro Blackness, because we were borrowing from, you know, Sun Ra and, and other, you know, and other uh, scholars trying to uh, basically, you know, spin off of that idea of, for want of a better term. Uh, I like the idea of making up new terms and, and because the idea is that, you know, if you look at like, say, um, it's Van uh, Cesare Rone's book, The Seven Beauties of, Seven, of Science Fiction, you know, one of the things that you do when you have a new, when you have a new idea is you make up what he called fictive neology, that is like fictive terms, you know, terms to go with the things that you've created. And if you think about race as a, or, or, or identity as this type of like new technology, then what are the, the, the terms that you have to create to destroy, it? I mean, to, to describe it, you know? And so I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, that's a good question, it depends though. Uh, so, so um, you know, I was thinking about uh, the idea of, well, Kindred, for instance, which is a time travel narrative, you know, uh, and I have, have a lot of thoughts about time travel and Afrofuturism. You know, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily, it, it's technically not like a 
the sci-fi you know story it actually has more things to do with the gothic you know and, and these horror spaces and we, and we want to bring it's it a horror story it's, it's horror very story. scary very scary is that we i mean we literally won a bram stoker for it <laughs> so it's like you know but it gets there was a there was a time when all these different things were being couched under Afrofuturism. And I think that might have bothered me because it was ignoring things around genre, you know, that kind of thing. So um, you know, when it when this version of African futurism is is kind of like brought into vogue, primarily by a colleague Nettie Akorafor, I think she is was trying to think about her place as a, a black woman of Nigerian and descent, you know, in this particular space. And trying to figure out like well, what what are some of the stories that are being told from the continent of Africa, you know, which I think is a very as as you touched saying, you know, where are you in your in your place? Like how are you where where are the things that are informing you? Like I deliberately make stories about the South, about the American South, you know, because I I, I grew up in post civil rights era, you know, rural spaces in Mississippi. So um, yeah, I definitely think that there is a distinction, but also I think. These days, I call myself an Afro speculative scholar because I'm thinking it because I'm I'm very much interested in the future, but I'm also thinking about speculative spaces that are kind of unmaking the past, or as Lisa Yazik says, uh, reclaiming the history, uh, the history of the future. You know, that, which I think is a really interesting idea too. But yeah, and I think we should know too that the term Black speculative fiction is now used as an umbrella yeah. um, for works that are Afrofuturist, surrealist. Um, the ethnogothic yeah. horror stories and the works that the, um, the Illinois Humanities Society, the books that they're reviewing currently, um, I think all fall under the, the auspices of Black speculative fiction um, and, and have this range. You know, I think about Toni Morrison's work in the level of surrealism. Well, what yeah. we would have called surrealism, except right. for in African-oriented thinking, um, the, these spaces are real. Mm -hmm. um, so often in the surrealism dialogue, it's you're talking about a dream space. Right. Um, and but in the African orientation of thinking, it's no, these are real spaces. Right. Right. Uh, and you can be sharing these spaces. It's the the language of the seen and the unseen in the same space. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It's this yeah. presence that's part of, like, I think the aesthetic, right? I mean, like, you know, the, the way that, for instance, if you look at from a from a chrono politic, where like, you know, a Western idea is thinking about like time moving forward, right? <laughs> but you know, an Afrofuturist idea or, or or this kind of diasporic idea is like, well, the ancestors are here, and so are your unborn children at the same time, <laughs> right? And you can right. see something like that in like daughter, daughters, daughters of the dust, right? When I was have, literally like, just thinking that. Right. Your, yes. <laughs> when you actually have like an unborn child that's actually narrating the story, by the way, from the future, mm -hmm. then actually is haunting the present. I'm like, what? That's a very, very interesting concept as far as like how time works, right? Um, right. And as an associate producer who worked on that film, who's based out of Chicago, he's actually a film curator, um, Floyd Webb. Yeah. And he says that the uh, original intention for Daughters of the Dust was for it to be part of one of three films, yeah. uh, all of which were Afrofuturist in nature. So oh. she was making that particular film with Afrofuturism in mind. And to that end, it's probably not surprising that it's been referenced in um, Beyonce's piece. Yes. Um, oh, right, I which is, yeah. right. Yeah, well, she referenced that uh, particular, some of the scenes there. Uh, again, talking about this idea of what you said, co-presence, or mm -hmm. the future past and, and present uh, all overlapping into one. Uh, these are ideas, I think, that we see that are very prevalent uh, in Toni Morrison's work, uh, in, in Kindred in some ways, yeah, as yeah, well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah the, I mean, yeah. The, the, the ancestor, the, the, the hungry ghost or the ancestor is a type of angry technology, I think it's definitely... Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Right. Um, I was gonna say and, uh, too, also great. in the Kingdom of the World, you know, which I had oh, an yes. opportunity to read. You know, it was really cool. It was just, you know, just this idea of the the spirits, the ancestors being with you and always present. Uh, it, it collapses time. And it yeah. also collapses the idea of physicality. But again, this is the language of the seen and the unseen. 
That's so funny. Someone here is asking, have we heard of Black quantum futurism? Yes, we know Rashida Phillips and more mother. And I was literally just thinking about them as I was talking about collapsing time yes. um, because of the work that they do. Well, and the other thing around time too, I have, I've, been, I've been thinking around uh, just the, uh, the generative natures of why people time travel in Afrofuturism of Black experiment work. And I came with this term, uh, Denia chronosomatic travel, right? So it's a lot. Oh, that's of, an interesting term. Say it again. Denia chronosomatic, right? And so okay. what I came up with is, because uh, I love making up words, right? So, so what I defined it as is uh, a speculative fiction trope that is, a, that is signified in a narrative by a character time traveling without a time machine due to various modes of either physical or mental pain or trauma exacted upon their person or state of mind. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so a lot of times, uh, and here's a, a little graphic I made where stuff like Kindred, um, Connecticut, Yankee and King Arthur's Court, the Captain Blackman, uh, other things like um, like Don't Let Go, for instance, which just came out a couple of years ago, there's a traumatic incident that actually spurs the, tra the, the, the travel, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times it's not a TARDIS or like a DeLorean involved, but it's some type of like existential travel that is connected to the trauma and the resolution of that trauma, right? Right. And so what I've been thinking a lot about is, well, can we get like some voluptosomatic <laughs> travel, right, which is like pleasure? <laughs> and uh, the only one I could think of uh, was a couple. One is, is the comic strip uh, Tommy Traveler by, um, by Tom Feelings, which was published in 1950s, uh, 58 or so, about a kid, a little black kid who could actually time travel by reading about black history, which I thought was really mm -hmm. cool. And of course, there's a Mary Baraka's uh, Rhythm Travel, which, you know, you could actually turn into music and then travel through the music and you will be part of wherever that music has been played or will be played, which I thought was really amazing too. And that's actually in Dark Matter. I think he might have wrote it for Dark Matter, actually. So those right. are the types of things I think about with time travel and stuff. But um, You know I what I want to know too, John? Yeah, go oh, go ahead. You were about to show an image. No, 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 no. Go ahead. No, because this, all right. I was going to shift gears. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to suggest that we mentioned some Chicagoans who uh, we think of as Afrofuturists or how Chicago and Illinois, uh, where it falls in the world of Afrofuturism. Oh, the idea of Chicago, I think it's, um, well, first of all, I think in some ways, like Chicago was Wakanda, right? <laughs> because the, or the idea of Wakanda, you know, as far as like a new space, um, I think of it as a black city, you know, uh, and also we're talking about Sankofa, I mean, the city itself, I mean, it's called the second city because it literally burned to the ground, right? <laughs> and then it's like kind of built on the bones of itself, you know, it's a really remarkable city to me, you know? Um, yeah, and a lot of it's about like, you know, only like creating uh, new ideas around how Black people are going to move through the world. But, you know, I, I definitely think of it as there's this kind of promised land aspect to it, right? Where, you know, if you're coming up from the South from like, you know, Jim Crow, Jim Crow experiences, uh, not realizing, of course, that there's a different type of racism at, you know, that was at right. the start, you know. But, but uh, I think what was really interesting is just the, the idea of people going to another space to create a new future, yes. um, living a life, being who, being able to live in a way where they could see themselves uh, as how they saw themselves, uh, yeah. rather than being into these limited spaces. And uh, I'm just constantly reminded by that. Mm -hmm. um, because so much of my family, um, you know, was from Mississippi and they left Mississippi um, heading to Chicago looking to create this new future. There are a couple pictures um, that I wanted to just mention brief, you know, if we have an opportunity to showcase them, I want to mention a few people. One is uh, Sun Ra, who spent uh, his formative years here in Chicago in the That's 50s. Right. Someone just um, mentioned that. Brad Smith just mentioned that. <laughs> oh yeah, hey there, Brad. Um, there, yeah. Some people believe that the alien encounter um, that helped him to shift his musical uh, perspectives took place here in Chicago when he was living in the Bronzeville area. Uh, he would sometimes go into Washington Park and pass out leaflets um, talking about um, new futures talking about being a myth and I, I think if you want to learn more about Sun Ra and his ideas you should check out Space is the Place of course, uh, yeah. and but Sun Ra also he uh, you know had a lot of musicians one of those musicians was Phil Coran and when Sun Ra went to New York uh, Phil Coran was still here in Chicago, and he and several other people helped form the AACM, 
which was a jazz collective utilizing a lot of the ideas that Sun Ra helped develop. Uh, and this free jazz collective, well, mm -hmm. actually it innovated free jazz. Uh, they still exist today, over a hundred or so members. Wow. And they are creating what they call real black music. Um, but there's a level of experimentation and now, jazz is already improvisational. So if you say it's jazz with more experimentation, what does that mean exactly? Right. Um, you know, so there's a film called Some Sing, Some Cry that was shot here in Chicago. Sun Ra was in that film. Mm -hmm. And it talks about jazz as space and place um, in really interesting ways. Uh, this idea of improvisation, the timing of jazz, uh, the rigidity of the construction and how people navigate through it being a symbol of how Black people in modernity had to navigate through confined spaces um, by improvising. Right. Uh, and, and, and then also in that film, he declared that jazz is dead because oh, wow. when that changes, now this is a movie that came out in the 50s, you know, created by a Chicago filmmaker. Uh, and he said, when... Uh, people have more freedoms, the music has to change because you can't operate in those same constructions, hmm. um, which I thought was very interesting. And uh, I'd like to also mention uh, uh, the, oh, the cry of jazz. Thank you very much, Brad. <laughs> and then there's also, um, there's Johnny Coleman, who's a, a minister in the New Thought Arena I like to bring up often because she trained her parishioners, um, myself being one of them, to think about futures. Hmm you know, and gave them a language for how to use the imagination to create the lives that they wanted to live, uh, but also really emphasized this idea of interdimensionality, that you are a entity in the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and to think of yourself as a person in the universe. And I, I compare that almost how Sun Ra would say, think of himself as sometimes being alien, but also, you know, the idea of being of space. Yes. So yes. that way of reimagining oneself takes them out of a certain set of limitations. Uh, I do want to ask you, though, mm -hmm. what do you, how do you think Afrofuturism kind of helps us to re-engage with history and imagine a future? Well, I mean, I think it's an interesting question because one of the things that I, one of the, the terms that I came up with, like I said, I love making up words and coming up with I, I'm just really, You're really good at coming up with words, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm really influenced by, uh, like I said, Isvan Cesare Rone's work about making new words for new things, but also, of course, uh, Kaiwo Ishun's book, More Brilliant Than the Sun, where he basically is talking about like sonic modernity and sonic, sonic fictions, and he makes up these crazy terms, and then he starts to define them. And I think that's actually, that's a very sci-fi thing to do, you know, mm -hmm. because if you have these, you have these new ideas, you've got to have like new terms for them, right? And then how do those terms and how those, how those technologies affect how we're moving forward? Now, Sankofa ration is a term I came up with, right? Let's looking at like Sankofa, which you mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, also uh, filmed by uh, Haile Jarima, right? Which is just recently uh, redistributed by uh, Array, uh, Ava DuVernay's company. Um, Sankofa is a really interesting tech, uh, kind of way of looking at the past and the present and the future because it literally means, it's an Akan term, it literally means like go back and get it or learning from the past, right? And one of the things that's really interesting to me about like just the burden of like Black speculative fiction, I think in general, is that, you know, one of the things we want to do is try to un undisrupt, you know, uh, Black pasts so we can move forward, right? Uh, and a, Perfect example, quite fairly recently, is uh, this this film called "See You Yesterday," um, which is uh, it's a time travel film. I forget the director, but it's a Netflix show. It's about a young black woman who literally creates time travel when <laughs> she creates time travel. But you know, she's a, she lives in an urban environment. Her um, her brother's killed by a uh, random police accident. So instead of having, you know going back to meet like Bessie Coleman or like to go back in time and talk to, to James Baldwin she has to use her newly formed fantastic device to go and try to save her brother's life. And what I'm saying is that sometimes there's this like burden because of this disruption on, 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 on uh, Afrofuturism or like Afro, you know, African speculative work to fix the past sometimes, you know, and it, which is kind of a dystopic thing. These days I'm trying to, to move forward a lot more as far as like, you know, Sankofa is looking backwards and forward simultaneously. The other form, uh, the other symbol that, that is associated with it, besides the heart-shaped uh, Akan piece, 
is a bird, right? It's a, it's a Sankofa bird that's reaching back, arcing back over its own shoulders to, to grab this egg, you know, which is the knowledge of the past to bring to the future, right? So, which is um, funny because usually the egg is a symbol of a future. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so what it is like is one big circle, right? You know, it's one big circular thing. It's not a linear thing at all. It's actually these, these, these uh, futures and pasts are, are intermixing and, and, and moving forward together, you know? Right. And the Sankofa symbol is uh, from the Akan culture in Ghana. Right. And it appears to be much older. Um, I was oh. watching a video recently and that particular symbol was found on the wall of some pyramids. Yeah, see, in ancient and Egypt. Yeah, and that that, that that's, a, that's such an amazing term. And, and I think that um, in general, you know, this 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 idea of aspiration and, and the future is something that's really really a, a very powerful aspect of uh, of Afrofuturism. Which is why, um, and this is something that's part of a old, one of the first questions about place and space was. Uh, me and my friend Rico Chapman uh, created this uh, this venue called Planet Deep South that was looking at like southern futures in the global south. You know, um, Sun Ra is originally from uh, from the south, right? Uh, George Clinton is originally from the south. We look at like a character or, or, or a, a literary figure like Henry Dumas, who influenced you know uh, to a certain degree Tony, Tony Morrison's work. He you know he's from the south, <laughs> and he ends up. And but let me know all of them. What, well, you were just about to say what I was going to say. Well, go ahead. Talk about, go ahead. No, go you were going to say that he was teaching uh, yes. in Illinois. <laughs> he taught, he taught at Illinois State University. That's right. And as oh. all of those individuals who you mentioned, and this goes to show the power of the Great Migration. So yeah. many people can talk about being from the south, uh, but so many of these aspirations and dreams materialized as they were in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of the, the people you named, with the exception of George Clinton, of course, who performs here all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I think about that, uh, that they were able to come here in the state of Illinois and create these ideas and be informed. And to that extent, you know, maybe even meet Black people who from other spaces That's right. who helped them, you know, where they were, you know, because people were very much segregated, um, particularly when they were coming out uh, during the Great Migration. And this idea of, you know, Sun Ra, my grandparents. <laughs> no, no, you're um, absolutely right. I mean, right. You know, all these other people kind of coming together, Mahalia Jackson, and they're learning from one another, you know, they're engaging at some point and how they articulate futures just comes up through their various disciplines. Um, I have to add again, house music is an yes. articulation of a future, you know, by teenagers looking to create futures music or music that they saw very much of the present, you know, using new beat machines. Um, yes. And that music, it, it sounds like what Cold War Wishan used to call alien music. Right, alien music, yeah. that's right. Right. Well, right. He also wrote a lot about the uh, the idea of the um, the futures industry, you know, which I thought was really interesting as well. And then, you know, how do you how do you actually like uh, untether you know industry from thinking about the future? I mean, because you're right, it is a futures industry. Or we're thinking constantly about well, what's you know what what's the next thing that's going to be colonized? That that kind of idea. Then, of course, you know, I think about a really really powerful Southern Afrofuturist, and that's uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Right, where he's really using aspirational, you know, theology, you know, to posit, you know, this future where everyone is equal. He's almost like a, a when he's talking about the mountaintop uh, in his, you know, in his dream, right? He's, he's kind of positing a Star Trek future, right? <laughs> where everybody's equal, holding hands, you know. Okay, so, that's why he convinced uh, Nichelle Nichols to stay on Star Trek. <laughs> exactly. And, and this idea that she's, she was representing, uh, you know, Blackness in the future, you know. Which, and she is also from Illinois, I might add, Robbins, Illinois, outside of Chicago. See? Because, and, and Martin Luther King spoke in Chicago and came to this great state. Because all people have to come through Chicago when they want to engage with futures uh, at some point. Um, particularly if they're looking to get insights from, I would say, modernity yeah. uh, building, you have to intersect with these ideas and these communities um, that are here in the, the city and, and to that extent in the state. I mean, when I think about, you know, what we should note too, just the idea of being in rural spaces, yeah. you know, because we're talking a lot about, you know, the city of Chicago itself, but the rural spaces and 
how futures are articulated there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking about with, when I brought in the idea of Planet Deep South, right? Where these uh, these notions. I mean, see, Jonathan Kelly, you read my mind too. I was thinking about publications. Look at them. I and know. This, oh, so, because I was just about to segue into thinking about the Chicago Defender, who Itasha actually used to work for as well. Yes. Um, there is the first black uh, and oldest uh, comic strip was published in Black Comics was published by the Chicago Defender. It's called uh, Bungleton Green, right? It started in the 1920s or so, went to about 1964. So it turns out that there's a, um, there's a man from uh, Ohio named Jay Jackson, who used to work for the, for the pulp magazines, like Amazing Fantasy and stuff. He took, he took over Bungleton Green, uh, which was a gag strip. It was a comic, you know, it was a com comedy-based uh, strip, like a Beetle Bailey or something like that turns it into a time traveling, heroic, uh, sci-fi epic in the 19, in the 1940s, actually, like 45, you know? And I'm like, mm -hmm. and this is in the Chicago Defender, right? Is it getting ready to put mm -hmm. you know, a collection of these actually? Um, and I was just floored by this. And like, did this, did this, uh, this gentleman had worked for the, 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 um, the seminal like sci-fi magazines, right? And it brings that mentality to a black character in a black newspaper. I was in Chicago. You know, <laughs> you know? there's a prominent uh, politician in Chicago in the 90s who called the Chicago Defender because she uh, said she saw a spaceship. Oh, wow. See? And the paper <laughs> wrote about it. <laughs> and her sighting. Um, I just want to add a, a couple of other artists who came through Chicago who have music out now. Uh, Angel Bat Dawid. Uh, Chicago. Uh, she's originally from Kentucky, um, but her formulative musical, a lot of her musical experiences came from being with the AACM here, and she has music out. She's also part of the Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. uh, Afrofuturism Festival, which I'm a co-curator and which John is participating in. Um, there's also uh, Nicole Mitchell, who's a flautist, uh, and she's a part of the festival, but she uh, spent many of her adult years here in Chicago too. So um, the state of Illinois continues to shape these ideas of futures. And I think it, it also gives people a way to think about experimentation and have it be a part of culture and community mm -hmm. in a way that isn't highbrow initially. Yeah. You know, um, people have spaces to work with really experienced people to develop their voice. Yeah. Um, and, and I would even say as a, a journalist and a writer here, I would have to say that's part of my story, too. No, that's really that's really wonderful. And, and I was thinking about, again, about comics and connections with Afrofuturism. Of course, you know, Turtle on Lee, you know, set up. All right. Right. Started to, you know, it was the first time we heard about the idea of the Black Age of Comics uh, created like the first. Uh, black <coughs> comic book convention and actually inspired like a lot of these comic book spaces including my own right and also um you know was one of the first people to try to distribute black comics you know across the across the country as well you know uh, and, and a lot of these particular narratives are speculative in nature you know taking like cues from like you know ancient egypt and from west africa and you know very much thinking about liberation politics but as comics you know uh, the political aspects of comics. So I was, uh, you know, we, we were missed not to mention that. Um, you know, something else. Oh, yeah. And of course, like, you know, people like Stacey Robinson, who teaches at University of Illinois now. Um, I'm thinking about the future. Someone mentioned about, like, uh, Detroit and, and Motown. I think this definitely, like, anything I think thinking about, like, Black folk inter intersecting with technology, you are really thinking about, like, an Afrofuturist idea, you know. So, right. um, and then you had Stax Records here, Stax too. Records, exactly. And also, Chess Records. I'm sorry, not Stax Records. <laughs> so, that was okay. Memphis. I'm sorry, what you had was Chess Records. Chess Records. That was here. And, and VJ Records. Records. Yeah. Right. And Soul Train started here in Chicago. <coughs> um, and and th these are spaces, you know, I think for some people, you can feel like, oh, you're talking about the past. But the features that we are in were, and the ideas of Blackness that we're, grounded in were shaped by these future visions of the people who were mentioning. Yes. So that's right. You know, I just think that's what's the next thing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, well, this is great. Is there anything else you wanted to, to share before we start taking questions, John? No, I think I'm pretty good. I mean, I, I do. Well, I can, I can plug Megascope later. You know, he also, I'm my, my artist uh, authors on this too, but, um, 
Yeah, I, I oh. think we could go yeah. directly into talking about you know Q and A and see where we are with that. Hopefully, hopefully, That's yeah, yeah, this was uh, this was really great. It's always great talking to you. So <laughs> you too. I have to say that John is great. John uh, illustrated the cover for my Afrofuturism book when I first started. When I first heard the term Afrofuturism, John was uh, the first person I called. Uh, and we were discussing these ideas, so it's amazing to see where we are now. He's editor of Megascope, and I have a book, Black Cube. Um, there are some Chicago moments in the book. <laughs> so. so thank you. So um, thank you both, John yeah. and Natasha. Um, I, I have to admit that I've had the pleasure of hearing you, you share all of your excitement and knowledge for like a few hours now, which is in our previous conversations and this <laughs> conversation. And I hope that uh, this is the beginning of a long friendship. <laughs> so uh, I feel like I learned so much every time I, I hear from you. Um, I do want to open it up to the audience for any Q&A. Um, and I know there are some questions that have come through the chat and the Q&A already. So I'm just going to read them aloud to our speakers. I know you already covered a few of them. But before I do, I wanted to um, post our typical uh, community norms for conversations, um, which we or I'll ask Jen to do that. Thank you, Jen. She just did that for me. This is Real collaboration. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll ask you to take a second to read through the community norms um, and then we will begin. So I'll give you give you all a second to think about some questions that you might have and um, yeah Becky and as I said thinking about that can we just Let's give ourselves a hand for our color coordination. Look at all this orange. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> orange and blues and no, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was I was feeling pretty good about how we all looked on camera. So thank you for noting that. Um, <laughs> um all right. So if you've had a chance to look at some of the questions, I'm just gonna read a couple that came through that we may not have addressed already. Um so uh, Larissa Lynch asked earlier, um, and thank you for your question, does Chester Himes fit into the category of Afrofuturism? Why or why not? And that's interesting, because uh, Chester Himes, huh? Because Chester Himes primarily wrote detective fiction, correct? If I'm Mostly, but you know, he had an interesting quote about a black man's life being very surreal. Mm, that's right. He did. He did. And actually, I mean, and, this is some super nerdy stuff, but, um, you know, the character Luke Cage, uh, how he says Sweet Christmas as like his like, that actually mm -hmm. I think comes from a Chester Himes novel, actually, believe it or not. <laughs> so, Interesting. But, but um, I mean, personally, I think that, you know, for me, you know, any, anybody, any, any, any Black person writing during that time was obviously trying to think about better futures, you know what I'm saying, in publication. So, you know, maybe it might not necessarily be genre tropes as far as like, you know, science fiction and fantasy and those types of things, but, you know, maybe, you know. Um, and curious. someone can be thinking about these ideas in Afrofuturism <clears throat> and the works they create not specifically fall in that category too. Right. I think that's something to think about. Again, if you think about Afrofuturism, like, oh, everyone has a relationship to their future, yeah. Um, but how does that show up in the works that they create can be a little, that's a different conversation. Right, 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 right. I mean, the fact that he had, that he felt that he had to leave the country because he's an expatriate too. He, he went to, he ran to, went to France, as I recall, uh, Paris maybe. Um, I think that in itself is a, the fleeing <laughs> is a very futurist idea, like the, the migration, you know, like like, like a Henry Oscar Tanner to me with the Afrofuturist. He's like, I can't make it as a painter here. I'm going to leave the country and go to Paris, where he becomes like mm -hmm. an amazing painter, you know, that kind of thing. So the idea of like fl flight or migration to me maybe could could be, I don't know enough about his history to actually speak to it, but, you know, I, genre wise, I'd be, be curious to see how those things would fit into because genre is something that always like <laughs> it bothers me as far as like how you know how we talk about it you know what, what is the what is the intention of the genre that they that they write in you know mm. 
And then what rules did they have to follow in order to get published, yes. which can also, you know, I, I think about that now when I look at certain works by Black creators uh, in those times, Yes, you yes. know, the story <laughs> they may have wanted to write versus the story they had to write in order to get published. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because two, two things pop into my head when you say that. One of which is the character that um, Avery Brooks played in that that uh, that Star Trek episode, Far Beyond the Stars, mm -hmm. where you know he's having these like relapses back in time. He's imagined himself, you know, as as a as a writer in the 1950s. J Benjamin Sisko, the, the 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 black captain from the Star Trek show, he has this traumatic thing where he's time traveling. Right. It's a great episode. It's called Far Beyond the Stars, and this character that he plays, Benny. He makes some concessions in order to get his story published, you know. So it's still it's about the future, but he has to make it into a dream in order for it to be published, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, the other thing I thought about is um, the late great um, uh, uh, Van, oh my goodness Melvin Van Peebles, right? Because in order for him to even become a filmmaker, he had to write a certain amount. He had to go to France. He had to write a certain amount of like books to actually become like uh, part of their uh, you know that. I guess their tradition there and then actually have to like learn how to do filmmaking and then you know have, he, had, he had to skirt a lot of things to actually become you know a filmmaker in, in our country <laughs> you know so you know so, he, so there's a lot of things around technology and around thinking about the systems you know uh, which of course brings it brings to, to note stuff like Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison and you know us playing around with systems or, play, or, or messing around with systems you know Let's see I do two to you it's a great episode. I show it every year in my, my Afrofuturism class. He directed that episode too, Avery Brooks did. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I love that we're talking about Star Trek. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. I mean, how could you not actually? Yeah. <laughs> Now, with Star Trek yeah. Discovery, but oh my God. Okay, you know what? That's, a, that's a wormhole. We're not going to go down. That's we're just super nerdy. That's a second. That's Afrofuturism. Not as nerdy as, as Dr. Who, <laughs> but uh, you know. Oh, man, I love Dr. Who. Um, okay, yeah. moving on. Uh, we have a wonderful question from uh, Tia Williams, mm. um, which I think it kind of follows this question of like, is this Afrofuturism? Is this not Afrofuturism? So would you consider Lovecraft country Afrofuturism? I'm thinking specifically about the storyline when the mother is taken by aliens and brought to her true self. So it definitely sounds like what yeah. you discussed with Dr. Hines is like, about like transformation, right? And, and kind of uh, coming into your own, right? Oh, no, see, it's mm -hmm. funny you mention that because what I liked about Lovecraft Country and uh, is first of all, it's it's a it's a black woman's vision of that particular story. It's a remix of a story written by a white man who's Matt Ruff, you know, uh, who, who writes about this, you know, and she takes that story and he remixes it, you know, with you know with people like Jordan Peele as well involved, right? And uh, but it was about pulp, you know, it was about it's about you know black pulp experiences but one of the things i love about it across i would say yes and i because one of the things is like those are some of the nerdiest ass black people i've ever seen in my life as far as like engagement with technology with mathematics with just like you know so many sciences and things of that nature they were they were like this whole family was steamed up <laughs> you know, they were well, and can i know that they were also in chicago Oh yeah, by the way, they were in Chicago. Yes, <laughs> they're in Chicago. Um, right, yes, that's a good point. Yeah, and I, I think that episode, uh, the one that was referenced, uh, she's going to space. The final segments are, uh, a lot of the references are from the film Space is the Place. That's right. If you look at the right. opening of that film uh, that Sun Ra was in, his voice was in that segment, mm -hmm. uh, but he's also in it. Uh, but I would say the whole piece, again, falls as Black speculative fiction with the last, um, because a lot of Jordan Peele's work uh, is, is so popular now. So the idea of Black horror, ethnogothic, um, is is clearly intermixed in there you know i would say it actually was a mix of a couple of things you had afrofuturism yep. you had the ethnogothic mm -hmm. um there were surreal elements yep definitely uh, you know I, and you know one of the things too that i think that makes those particular i showed those two episodes in my afrofuturism class one was i am and the other one of course is when they time travel back to um the Tulsa Race Massacre right where she uh, becomes yeah. the vehicle she is the time travel mechanism right so you have the black body as technology, you know, so that's something that kind of really like dials into like some of Beth Coleman's work about racist technology. Something we talk about in the class, you know, the final project of that class, by the way, is they have to create a diegetic prototype that is a, um, 
that is a, a mechanism by which you know black people can move forward. So a liberation technology. I put a link in the, the chat here where if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you see some of the, the, the projects that students came up with. And it's not an art class per se, but it's like, I want to, it's a critical making project where they have to make these types of like liberation technologies. But yes, I would say definitely it has aspects of all those things. Um, I was fortunate enough to, because uh, Angela Ellis is from Mississippi and we have, a, we have a, um, a common friend and I met her and we, she actually zoomed into my class and I didn't record it because I wanted it to be special and to, to be like, you know, the special moment. And she was amazing talking about it. What's really crazy, you know, she's never watched the show. Wow. Never seen the show. She said that she couldn't, she, she didn't want to spoil it for herself. Like she said, when she was reading the script, she was like, there's no way that anything could match what I see in my head for this. So she's, she's read the comments on it. She's read about the criticisms of it, that kind of thing. Never seen one episode of it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But she, she did an was, amazing job. Everyone in, involved in that project did. She was incredible. Yeah, there's so many things that are in that show. Like some people didn't dig it as much as, I, I mean, I, I thought it was. It was amazing. It was, it was groundbreaking. A celebration, a celebration of like Black spiritual culture. I felt like, you know, like, like, like the, the stuff that we were writing about was, was on screen. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it, it really insane. was. You could, they really did their homework. You could tell that they really contextualized it and Maybe even some of the things we wrote, to be honest with you. I, I mean, no in terms idea. of right, <laughs> the, the whole point is just the framing of it. It was also on point. Um, and it was almost surprising to see it on some of those elements on screen. You're like, oh, wow. Yeah. You're going yeah. To it, go like, there. The idea of like the, the of Victor Hugo's Green Book, right, which they were kind of emulating, that's Af an Afrofuturist notion, right, where you're protecting, you actually have to, to hack into a, a, a system of highways and actually like create a publication that saves, that could potentially save Black people's lives, right? That's, you know, <laughs> I think that's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, also, I wanted to ask um, two more questions. I have one from the audience and then there's kind of a, a collective question that we're going to ask both of you and those folks who are in the audience um, and see what everybody has to say. And then, and then we'll call it a, a wonderful evening. So a question from the audience from Brad Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, what relationship do you see between Pan-Africanism and Afrofuturism? Hmm. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I think these days, uh, first, okay, let me, let me, because that's, that's a complex question, right? Because one of the things that I think about as a watershed moment in uh, this particular iteration of Afrofuturist thought is the Black Panther film, right? Where you see like an imagined Africa that is a Pan-Africanist kind of dreamscape, right? Because you, you know, Wakanda doesn't exist. It's, it's kind of like this, this, te it's this, this technotopia, you know, that has never been conquered. But it also has aspects of various, you know, African cultures simultaneously, which, you know, I think in, in a lot of times in, in the, the Black American mind, we want to create like a unified Africa, right? We want to have a Pan-Africanist vision, you know, a lot of times, right? Um, so I think there is a tenuous connection. I think it's really interesting because I've seen like, as Natasha has talked about, you know, people in Africa making work that they're calling Afrofuturist as well, you know, so I think that this particular iteration of it uh, has some uh, some aspects that definitely speak to people throughout the diaspora and throughout the, co the, the country, you know, uh, I mean, I'm various countries of, of the continent of Africa. So I think there could be a relationship. Um, well, I think that you could, it's a symbiotic relationship, you know, yeah. in that I don't, I don't know how one could write about Afrofuturism and not have an understanding relationship or relative grounding around pan-Africanism mm -hmm. as an idea. Right. Um, at, at the very least, you know, understanding it as an idea, having some relationship to why that idea emerged. Um, and, you know, when you go back to say some of the origins, I think one of the first um, persons to kind of use the term or, or cultivate that came out of Trinidad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the desire to have different Black people, you know, who are from different spaces, late 1800s, early 1900s, to envision a future, right? Um, and so I, you can't not engage that. Um, I think in, you know, in our present space, there's people who have various ideas about Pan-Africanism um, that 
is not always necessarily aligned with some of the ideas that lent it to existing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the whole point of thinking about agency, you know, Black people having agency um, in their lives is really at the heart of Pan-Africanism. And I think the to, and the same idea with Afrofuturism, you know, people of the continent and the diaspora being able to envision futures that they can materialize. Mm. Okay. I love that idea. I mean, I, I love that it's, I love how inclusive the concept of Afrofuturism is, <laughs> that it brings everybody together in different kinds of projects, but that are all about kind of imagining a different future, mm. whether it's reinvention of the self, reinvention of community, reinvention of nation, reinvention of the past in some ways, what the past means um, for the future, for the present. I think that's really tremendous. So um, I have a question for you that we've posed to all of our guests as well in the audience. And um, I'm curious to hear what your answer might be. So what lessons or ideas from Afrofuturism do you take with you as you walk through your everyday life? And guests in the audience, what lessons about Afrofuturism that you already knew or learned tonight will you take with you as you walk through your everyday life? Mm, it's a great question. It is a great question. I think, I think for me, like, oh, being the father of a two-year-old right now <laughs> has really pulled, it has really like changed the way I think about the, my practice, you know? Um, I have to say, like, when I started thinking about Afrofuturism, say, like, 2007, 2008, you know, uh, I've definitely, like, reformulated ways that I think about Black futurity. And um, and these days, I tend to think about Afrofuturism or, Af or, an, or an Afrofuturist idea as more of a space that I want to get to, you know. So whether you're doing, like, the ethnographic or Black horror or, like, Afro-surrealism or African futurism, I think we're all... We're on it. We're on the same path. We want black people to make it. <laughs> we want black people to be alive in the future, um, which is a very like straightforward idea. I want my son to be happy and healthy and in a space that loves him as much as I do. You know, and um, you know, so so the things that I make, the the the, the rhetoric that I that, that I make with my with my hands, the you know the classes that I teach. I teach three classes on Afrofuturism, um, comics, horror, and just aesthetics. They're all pushing towards this idea that you know, we need to be in the future, right? And anything that doesn't stand by that particular, you know, idea, I'm not down with. It's just, it's, it's that simple. <laughs> so like my everyday epistemology is like, well, how do I protect this aspect of the future? And then, which is my son, but then also my students, you know, cause they gotta get, we gotta get there. So it's a, to me, it's a destination, you know? I well, one of the first things that I realized in talking about Afrofuturism was that <laughs> there's so many people who the whole notion of dreaming of a future was um, something that they would push up against, mm -hmm. you know, so there being this sort of tango dance between, hey, you can envision a future. And then people saying, yeah, but, um, and how that manifested um, in, in people's lives, you know, people not writing stories that are coming to them because they're already assuming there is no place for it in the public sphere. So they won't even write it down, you know, or putting images that are coming to them that are African, African diasporic in nature, not completely understanding what the symbols mean, but the symbols are a part are coming to them and feeling, wow, I need to hide this under my bed because no one will understand. So I'm a, an enthusiast of the term Afrofuturism um, because when people hear that term, when they see books by John or myself or people saying these things, they can say, oh, this is who I am. This is where this work falls. This is what it means. It's okay to think about these ideas. Uh, it doesn't make me weird or odd. And oh, look, I'm part of a larger trajectory of people who thought about this in the past. And wow, I'm thinking the same things. I'm in Chicago, but there's someone in 
a crowd or someone in the car or someone in Paris, they think the same thing. And mm-hmm. they're coming from it based on where they're from. So that connectivity that comes when people recognize the term, when they recognize it's okay to imagine, when they recognize the things they're imagining have deeper implications, when they felt comfortable um, creating and the insights that come from that creation, to me, that is what's powerful about these particular works. This is, um, so that's something I think about, you know, and I also am more cognizant of there being constant communication between these ideas of people across times and spaces, you know, where the question I have uh, that may be one that was, you know, rooted coming through me, there's an answer to it. Someone in Paris has an answer to it. You know, the question someone has in Paris around these ideas, you know, there's someone in Bahia who has the answer to it, or there's a whole tradition in Bahia that speaks to this thing that, you know, a Black kid growing up in the UK, you know, was just speculating about, but the language for it is in Bahia, you know, or the language for it is in Chicago, or the language for it is in, you know, these different places, and you're like, wait a minute, I'm not alone, it's not just me, Uh, and there's a whole field of study of people who approach these ideas of space and time through black identity, but they're located somewhere else. Or maybe they're across the street and I just never talk to them about these ideas. So it's the the community and how that community sparks insights and reflections uh, and changes people in real time. So they take another set of actions. Uh, That's what I, I find to be very special. I love that about the interconnectedness of everybody. The answer, the question might be asked one place and the answer might be someplace and and else. And you just have to find the person with the answer, whoever they are, if it's in the past or in another country. And Um, if I may say this, Becky, just before you wrap up, you know, I think the value of Afrofuturism for for people who didn't necessarily grow up in African, African diaspora cultures is that the answer to their questions is can be in these works as well. You know, um, Afrofuturism is the missing piece of this larger conversation about futures or to that in, you know, science fictions that we have been having. Uh, and these perspectives, um, you know, in the indigenous world and and African African diasporic spaces and Latinx spaces, you know, uh, all these spaces that have not ended up, we are not cognizant of where the knowledge is and where the lived experiences have been shaped uh, and how they could be answers to our questions as human beings. I couldn't say it better than that. Thank you so much, Natasha and John. And I have to say there are some wonderful imaginings and lessons that have come in through the chat from- Yeah, I mean, I just saw they're doing. <laughs> about time travel and the centering of the body in this process and the, the need to just keep learning and reading and discovering and exploring. Um, I The blues as a technology, I mean, this is tremendous. So. Um, we're going to share some of these answers back in a response to all the folks who signed up for tonight. Awesome. And this is a recorded event, so um, people can access it in the future as well. The future um, <laughs> as well, <laughs> and we hope that they will. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. We're going to post a few links in the chat in the chat for you, just so you can learn a little bit more about the big read. And if you wanna join us, we're starting to read in the kingdom of this world in March. So you're welcome to join a book group or just ask for a free copy of the book. We have other public programs coming up that Jen has posted in mm. the chat. So um, one's on oral history at the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. And that's next month. Actually, it's in like a couple of weeks. Um, and before we go, I just want to thank you, Tasha and John, for just making time. I, I know I watch, I look at their social media feeds, so I know that they're two of the busiest people in the world. Um, so the fact that they made time for us is really an honor. Um, and I just wanted to um, thank them and then remind you that I have huge thanks for the National Endowment for the Arts and Arts Midwest 
and um, all of the people who have created this event and attended this event. And I hope we'll see you all again. Thank you so much for everything. Have a great night. Thank you.